What do you say we make a hammer? This particular hammer is a double diagonal peen hammer, and the one I have is actually a modified sledgehammer. It's a store-bought hammer. All I did was change the profile a little bit. Probably did this close to 30 years ago. I still use it fairly regularly when I need a big hammer for some big drawing out or big spreading work. Because it's a diagonal peen, your hand is offset in a more comfortable, natural position. And because there's a peen set at an angle on both sides, one of them works for spreading and one of them works for drawing out. Can be a very handy hammer, not an absolute necessity in the shop by any means. But a lot of people have seen this hammer, they've asked about it, and one of you folks out there got on my waiting list way back in August, and I'm finally getting around to making the hammer that he asked for, so we're going to make one from scratch today, I hope. And this will be one of those videos that is not really a how-to video. I don't mean this as a tutorial. I will probably not explain everything I'm doing because at this point, I'm not 100% sure about everything I'm doing. This is a little bit experimental because, as I said, this one I just modified a hammer. Today we're starting from scratch. It's going to be one of the first hammers I've made using the new Samac hammer, although I've been working on a couple little practice hammers just to test it out. Test out a new punch I made which is made out of the Atlantic 33 or the Flutagon. So far, I'm really impressed with this. I've had this at a dull red, quenched it in water, gone back to work with it. Still looks like it did right after I made it. This is a round punch, and I'll try to explain during the video why round punch creates an oval eye, even though you're punching a round hole. And it's about three quarters of an inch diameter on the working end, tapers slightly up the shaft, and this is about three and a half inches long. If anything, it's a little bit too long because the working height on the SAMAC isn't real tall, but it is tall enough to get a four pound hammer and this punch under it and still get enough work done. It'll take a few heats to punch the hole, but it does do it. Now, a lot of this is based on what Brent Bailey shows in his videos. I'm trying to learn from him because he is one of the most efficient people I've ever seen use a power hammer, and he makes hammers all the time. So learning from his techniques is really good. I'll put a link right up here to his channel. You can go watch some of his videos if you want to. And uh, earlier I mentioned he's got a book out now, 10 Hammers, talks about how to make them. We aren't making one of the hammers that he shows in his book. The techniques won't be exactly like his because I don't have the exact same tooling he has. And he uses a 250 pound hammer instead of my 60 kilogram, a roughly 120 pound hammer. Now my material I'm starting with is a piece of S7. I bought a great big round of S7 the other day, three and a half inches in diameter. And I cut it into slices that will make hammers from about two and a half pounds to about eight pounds. I've got one here that I'm hoping to get an eight pound hammer that'll be a sledgehammer that I can use in the shop. And that'll be the heaviest hammer I've ever made. We'll do that for a video some other time. But I've got one round here that is three pounds, 14 ounces. I'm aiming for a three and a half pound hammer, so I can't waste much material to scale or grinding, drilling, doing anything like that. So we're gonna do as much of this as we can by forging, get as clean a forging as I possibly can, so there's as little grinding as I can get away with. But the first thing we gotta do is go get this thing hot, and S7 needs to be good and hot to work it. I'll see you at the forge. Now because I'm going to leave the forge going the whole time and it's turned way up to work the S7, I'm probably going to leave the power hammer running most of the time because we're going to be working over there for most of the project. I'm going to do very little narration. If there's something really important, I'll stop, I'll turn this stuff off, tell you what I'm doing, then get back to work.
Well, I managed to get that hole punched a little bit off center, but I think we can save it. Now again, it's a round hole, but hammers have oval eyes. You saw how small of a slug that was punched out of there. That's not much material lost to punching the eye. So where does that material go? go? Well, it makes the sides of the hammer bulge out. Now, if the sides of the hammer are bulged out, we don't want them bulged out, and we push them back, what happens to that hole? Well, instantly, it becomes an oval hole. This is really a very efficient way to get a nice-shaped eye. If you have an oval punch, it really becomes important to get it lined up with the, the hammer head just right, or you end up with a crooked eye. This way, your eye almost always ends up perfectly in line with the hammer, because it doesn't matter how you orient that round punch. It matters more that you forge the sides back down evenly.
interesting to do kind of a final drifting with it here. This looks like it's not going to need a whole lot of grinding to clean up the ends or the profile of the hammer. And no, my glove isn't really on fire. It just smokes. Get it hot and drift the other side again. About the only problem I see with this hammer is that it went a little bit off on the diamond as a result of drawing this out. So as I flattened it in this direction, the whole hammer kind of went that way, so it leans a little bit that way. To fix it, I could stand it up this way, but I'd be crushing the eye and leaving a bevel on one side that doesn't match on the other side. And I'm not sure that it matters. Now looking at my original hammer, I can see that it's got a little bit of that off on the diamond too, for the same reason that when you forge these peens out, you're moving that entire bar, and because you're doing it on both ends, it magnifies it, it makes it twice as bad. I think the ultimate solution is to make a great big set of V-blocks that I can use under the hammer that would force it back square. Unfortunately, that's just one more thing to add to my list of tools, jigs, dies, and fixtures that I need to make for use in the shop. I could probably do nothing but tools for a year before I satisfied all those needs. The good news is, though, that because this hammer is always used off at an angle, that is probably never going to affect the use of the hammer. It's more of an aesthetic thing. And after that cools off and I can hold it in my hand, grind it, maybe I'll mock it up on a handle and see just how bad it is. I'm hoping it's not too bad and I might actually be able to grind some of that out. But if it looks like it's going to be a problem, I might have to make the V-blocks, put that hammer back in the fire and just see if we can correct that that way and then redrift it and hope that's all it takes. So this is just going to be a part one video because that needs to cool as slowly as possible or it's going to be a real bugger to grind and I want it to be easy to grind so I'm going to cool it overnight. And since the sun is setting, it's a good time to quit for the day, so I'm going to head in. I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.